This is David Pawson's ministry, and you are listening to Jesus, the Seven Wonders of His Story. This talk, in ten parts, covers what the Bible says about Jesus, who he was, why he came, and what we can expect when he returns. Based on the middle section of the Apostles' Creed, David covers the fundamental facts on which the Christian faith is based. Part 8 his ascension. Jesus came into this world in a different way to everybody else, and he went out of this world in a different way to everybody else. Both were quite unique. I've told you about his birth, his arrival, how different that was. But now I'm going to talk about his departure, and it's very different. I told you, I think, yesterday that he didn't leave this world until two months after he died. Amazing. And that he took his body with him, which nobody else does. And that he left this world while he was still alive. Now nobody else has left this world in such a manner. We call it his ascension. Now the crucifixion and the resurrection are central to our faith and fundamental to it. But without the incarnation before those three things, or the crucifixion, burial and resurrection are central, but the incarnation preceded them and his ascension followed them. And therefore the incarnation coming into the world prepared for those three facts and the ascension completed them when he went back to heaven. The church calendar has always included ascension day and every Christian creed ever written always includes he ascended to heaven after the resurrection. And yet, surprisingly, the ascension is possibly the most neglected item in the creed. Put your hand up if you can remember when you last heard a sermon on the ascension. Just put your hand up. One, two, three, four, those two were together. Was it the same preacher? <laughs> Four people can remember any preaching about the ascension. Well, you're going to remember this morning because I'm going to do it. It's so much part of our faith, so much part of the story of Jesus, yet it's neglected. Now, why should it be so neglected? Well, for one thing, it happened on a Thursday. So Ascension Day is not on a Sunday, and it tends to get overlooked. But then Christmas Day is not always on a Sunday, but we celebrate that. So I don't think the fact that Ascension came on 40 days after the resurrection and therefore midweek, I don't think that's the reason why we just never hear about it. Let's try a second reason. We'd all rather say hello than goodbye. We always love greeting people when they're coming, and we're rather sad when they go, hopefully. But um, so we celebrate Jesus coming, but we don't celebrate his going. Maybe it's because we don't like saying goodbye. But I don't think so because the 12 disciples were happy, or the 11 disciples as they were by now, were happy that he was going. They were filled with joy when he went. Goodbye, wonderful, goodbye. <laughs> that takes a bit of explaining. Is it psychological, the problem we have with the ascension? No, I don't think that's big enough. It could be theological, our problem. The Western church has always 
majored on the crucifixion and the Eastern Church has always majored on the resurrection and I must admit that I'm Eastern rather than Western in that. Both Protestants and Catholics have so stressed the crucifixion that the resurrection has somehow taken second place. But in the East, it's the resurrection that is the big thing. And on Easter Sunday, even in the streets of Moscow, people greet each other with the phrase, Christ is risen, and the response, He is risen indeed. It's the normal greeting in the streets. I don't think it is in America, but that's the way it is in the East. But neither Eastern nor Western churches have ever emphasized the ascension. They've said they believe in it, and it is part of the faith, but they don't preach it. They don't think about it from one year's end to the next, from one ascension day to the next. And uh, I, the church I go to completely ignores ascension day and I begged them to let me preach on Ascension Day, on a Thursday. And they said, we'll only let you preach if you write down everything you're going to say for our approval. <laughs> well, I was so desperate to preach on the Ascension, I wrote it all out for them, and they let me preach. But really, it's extraordinary. I think the real reason is what I call, not psychological, not chronological, not theological, but cosmological. Because we can't imagine where heaven is. We now know much more about the world and our earth and its pla place in the space. And the ascension doesn't seem to fit the way we think about our cosmos. Let me try and explain that. When people believed the earth was fixed and flat, heaven was above and hell was below. Life was very simple. Hell was down there, heaven up there, and Jesus ascended to heaven up there. They didn't know in those days that the earth is spinning round so fast as it travels through its orbit. And if heaven is straight up from Jerusalem, then where is straight up from Jerusalem? When it's spinning like this? And so we do find it difficult to say, where is heaven? With a spinning earth and with all the stars spinning around in ellipses. Where do you put heaven? And where did Jesus go and where is he now? Did he just disappear when he got as far as the clouds? We have all these questions. And more and more Christian scholars are saying the story of the ascension didn't happen. It's a myth. It's a story with a message, but it's not true historically. Well, I don't believe it is a myth. myth. When the first Russian went up into space, he came back and he made a joke. He told the Russians, I didn't see any angels. Well, that's true, he didn't, but they saw him. I think it's more true when an American astronaut was asked, did you meet God up there when he got back from space? And he said, no. But if I'd taken my spacesuit off, I would have done, <laughs> which was <laughs> true, very true. But the simple thing is that science has not found any sign of life outside Earth. They've hoped to find it. They've set up their radio telescopes, hoping desperately to get a message from out there. They've left tablets on the moon hoping that somebody out there will pick them up and understand the message. The human race is getting very lonely, have you noticed? We're desperate to find somebody else out there. And yet according to the Bible, out there is not empty space. It's full of life. The trouble is that science doesn't have the right instruments to see what's out there. Neither do we. We look into space, I've sat in the 
cradle of a large telescope and looked around the heavens. I didn't see any sign of life at all, but I knew it. It was full of life. The Bible says so. There are angels up there, thousands of them. And yes, the Russian astronaut didn't see them, but he, they saw him. The fact is that there is another layer of reality that with our senses we cannot see. And all scientific instruments are simply an extension of our senses, of sight or hearing or whatever, to enable us to have a sensual picture of what lies beyond. My answer is that heaven is everywhere except earth. That's how the Bible seems to think. It's always thinking of earth and heaven, as if there's nothing else. Fortunately, science is beginning to come round to this with the advent of what is called quantum physics. It was pioneered by a German called Max Planck. And he wasn't as thick as a plank. <laughs> he was a very clever scientist. And he has introduced ideas that 40 years ago science could not have accepted. He is now teaching that two physical objects can occupy the same space without being aware of each other. That solid objects can pass through solid objects and appear somewhere else. Now this kind of thinking to our popular science minds is ludicrous. But quantum physics is beginning to see a whole new pattern in the universe and believe that there can be things in your space that you can't see or be aware of. But the Bible's been saying this for years. There was a prophet, Elisha, and he was trapped in the city of Dothan. And his young man, who was his assistant, woke up early morning and he looked out from the city and he found the Syrian chariots all around the city, completely surrounded. He said, Elisha, look, they've got us covered, we're surrounded by chariots. And Elisha just said, Lord, open his eyes, please. <laughs> and he looked again, and he saw the chariots of heaven completely around the city, just above the Syrian chariots. It was a rare gift of God to see the invisible and to see the life that's there already, which we are not aware of. And uh, the young man was ashamed of himself. <laughs> And he realized there were more heavenly chariots than Syrian. So there was no problem, no worry. He just saw as everybody sees and he was worried. But as soon as God opened his eyes, he realized the situation was totally different. And I think sometimes we panic because we're only seeing what's happening in the world that everybody else sees. If we could see God's point of view and see what's happening in his sight. See, God is still on the throne. He's at peace. He's not worried about what's all happening. It's all going his way and he will end it all. And we read all the stark headlines in the press and we, we get panicky. We say, it's coming to an end. It's dreadful. Lord, open their eyes that they may see the real situation from God's point of view. So I think that's why we don't like the ascension. It doesn't fit our pseudo-scientific world. Where did he go? The answer is he left the earth, and when you leave the earth, you're in heaven. Of course, they were still thinking in those days of layers of heaven seven layers and they would talk about the heaven where the birds fly, the heaven where the clouds are, the heaven of the blue sky, so on up to the seventh heaven where God was. But in fact God is all around us. 
we live and move and have our being in God. So to ask where in the universe is heaven is the wrong question. We should be asking where is the universe in heaven? That's a different question. Heaven is all around us and we're not aware of it. The angels are all around us. Every service of worship held on earth is attended by angels. Did you know that? When I've been to a very small congregation to preach, in fact, I used to preach years ago to a congregation of one. Just one dear old lady who always turned up, even if the weather in the Shetland Islands was dreadful, gales blowing, she'd be there. And she always said to me, well, the Lord's here and you're here and I'm here, so let's have the whole service. And I had to play the little harmonium to, for the hymns. I had to take the collection from her. I had to preach to her. Some of the best services I ever attended. But when I've spoken to a small number and somebody asks me how many were there, I say thousands. And there were thousands. When we worship God, we're worshiping with the angels. We may not see them. And by the way, the angels study your hairstyle. Did you know that? When Paul talked about it being wrong for men to have long hair and ladies to have short hair, he said, because of the angels. They're watching you when you worship. And they want to see men who acknowledge that they're men and women who acknowledge that they're women. And we show that with our hairstyle. And the angels are watching us. And the <clears throat> Church of England liturgy makes it quite clear. Their liturgy for the communion service has a phrase in it, therefore with angels and archangels, we lord and magnify your holy name. Do you remember that? Angels join us while we worship. I've got a lovely recording of angels singing while a youth group was singing. And their song is just out of this world, literally. <laughs> but it's glorious music. And whenever you're singing, the angels are singing with you. Therefore, with all the company of heaven, we magnify God, the Lord but we don't see them. Occasionally God gives us the privilege of seeing an angel and I had such a privilege just a few months ago and it's an awe-inspiring experience. But God can open that other world to you occasionally. But it's only occasionally. It wouldn't be good for us to be seeing them all the time or we'd stop being any use here, we'd be so heavenly minded, we'd be so no earthly use. And we'd get preoccupied with that. One day we'll join them and we'll see them and we'll be with them, part of it. But God in his mercy and in his wisdom only gives us occasional glimpses of the world that is all around us. So Jesus just needed to leave the earth. And he was in heaven. It's all round us. It's everywhere else except earth. And so he left the earth and went to heaven. A senior bishop, the top bishop, Anglican Episcopalian bishop in Scotland, who has said some nasty things about me, he also said on the BBC, Jesus is not coming back because he never left. And he was preaching that on the BBC. I'm tempted to say rubbish. The Bible presents heaven as everywhere else except earth. And so Jesus had to leave the earth to go back home to heaven. And that's what they saw him do. I've talked about the disappearances of Jesus after the resurrection. But the last was not a disappearance because they saw him go. They only saw him go so far. And then he was carried to heaven in a cloud. 
and he disappeared from their sight in a cloud. I can tell you now that the wind was from the west on that day because that's the only direction that brings clouds to the Holy Land. I'm just trying to make it real for you. So with a good westerly wind, Jesus simply rose and then was carried above the cloud. And since he was above the cloud, at a certain point, they could only see the cloud. And they went on gazing up at the sky until the angels said, men of Galilee, why are you gazing at the sky? He'll come back. And he'll come back in the same way as he went. If only I'd had a camcorder and been able to film the ascension and then played the film in reverse, I've got a film of the second coming. <laughs> but I'm afraid they didn't have camcorders in those days and nobody thought of doing it. But he'll come back in the same way he went. So again, the forecast will be westerly winds and there'll be clouds and he'll come back down through the clouds. That's the way he went. That's the way he'll come back, as we'll see tomorrow morning. Now the universe is therefore packed with life. With life that's more intelligent than we are, stronger than we are. And God is revealed from heaven when he opens our eyes. When we need to see an angel to know that we're receiving heavenly help. And angels play a huge role in the story, as I've told you. If we don't believe in angels, there are whole parts of the story of Jesus that make nonsense. They were there at his conception. They were there at his birth, announcing it to the shepherds. They were there at his temptations in the wilderness. They were there in Gethsemane. They were there at the tomb. They were there at his ascension. And to show you how intelligent they are, they said to the disciples at the ascension, you men of Galilee. They could not have said that a week earlier because one disciple, Judas Iscariot, was not from Galilee. And so the angels would have got it wrong if Judas Iscariot had still been around, but they were right to say, men of Galilee, why are you gazing up into heaven? Because all that were left were from Galilee. I just throw that in. It's these little details that convince me we've got a truthful record of the occasion. Everything fits perfectly. And I notice, in fact, I'm going to read the story of the ascension to you now because I want you to notice how often they mention eyewitnesses five times in just a handful of verses. Just listen. After Jesus said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Did you notice how often there's a reference to looking, seeing, sight? This was an event which had eyewitness testimony. And it really happened. It was not a myth with a spiritual meaning. It was an event. It actually happened. And the disciples saw him go. That's not the way it happened before. For six weeks he appeared to them and then suddenly disappeared. And he was trying to prove to them that he was still with them when he disappeared and listening to their conversation. So though he disappeared, he was still there with them. Now they saw him go. And that's very different from the disappearances. He did disappear into the clouds, but they actually saw him go. 
and realized that he was leaving them. Realized that he was not going to stay listening to their conversation anymore. And you'd have thought that would have broken their hearts. Having lived with them for three years, their best friend has gone. And yet they went back into Jerusalem rejoicing. They even went back into Jerusalem doing something that no Jew would ever do. They worshipped him. Now for a Jew to worship a human being, that is utter blasphemy, utter treason. And yet they went back to Jerusalem worshipping Jesus, they now knew he was God, the Son of God, divine, fully divine. The carpenter from Nazareth with whom they'd lived and eaten and slept, they now were so sure was God that they were worshipping him. And they were glad that he'd gone back to heaven. They were rejoicing for him and for themselves. He could do far more for them in heaven than if he stayed on earth. And I'll prove that to you in a moment. So when did he ascend? 40 days after the resurrection, 10 days before the day of Pentecost. And we celebrate Pentecost on Sunday, but ascension on Thursday. Where was it? It was on the Mount of Olives, but just over the top from the city of Jerusalem. So it happened out of sight of the city. Just as Jesus did not appear to Pilate or Annas and Caiaphas, so at his ascension he didn't want unbelievers watching. And so he took the disciples up to the Mount of Olives, just over the top, out of sight of the city, and from there he ascended to heaven. I'm embarrassed to tell you there are now two churches on the Mount of Olives, which celebrate the ascension and they each have a kind of plaster cast with his footprints in to prove this was from where he ascended. Really what Christians will do. But that's the place certainly. How did he ascend? He didn't jump, he didn't spring up. He simply rose with his hands spread over them in blessing. And then when he got so high, the cloud came and lifted him and carried him, reminding me of a verse in the Psalms, he makes the winds, the clouds, his chariots. And so he ascended to heaven. A real event in time and space. He had appeared and disappeared for six weeks, but now they knew it was not quite permanent, but it was going to be a long time before they'd see him again. Now, such were the facts. What did it all mean? First, I want to ask, what did it mean for Jesus? And the first obvious thing to say is that he was going home. That's a lovely phrase, isn't it? I'm going home. Home is where you love the most. Home is where you folks are. Home is where you belong. Home is where you feel relaxed. And Jesus was going home. When we were little children and had to go away, we went away to school or for a holiday. When we came home, there was always a sheet of paper, just as you came in the front door, that said, welcome home. And there was a drawing underneath about what we've been doing or something else. My father always pinned up a welcome home whenever we came home. So when he died, I put on his gravestone, welcome home. <laughs> Lord Baden Powell, who was the founder of the Boy Scout movement, taught the boys how to follow each other following signs. And a sign might be an arrow this way or a line saying you're in the wrong way. But then there was one sign that said, I've gone home. And it was a circle with a dot in the middle. 
And when Lord Baden-Powell died, that's on his gravestone, just a circle and a dot. And every Boy Scout knows that it means I've gone home. He heaven is home to Jesus. That's where he'd been for so long. And now at the Ascension, he's going home. Been away for 33 years, but he's going home. Secondly, he's going home safe and sound. And he's been in battles, he's taken huge risks. While he's been away, he's faced great dangers. But he's coming home safe and sound, beyond the reach of his enemies, safe at last. And thirdly, he's coming home victorious. The Roman emperor would often send a son to go and deal with enemies in a far distant part of the empire, and the son would come home victorious, and the emperor would lay on a victory procession. And in that procession, there would be the victorious soldiers, the victorious son in his chariot, and then the prisoners of war in chains, and then, uh, what I'm searching for word, carts, whatever, wheeled vehicles with all the loot, with all the spoil that they'd taken from the enemy. And that whole procession, a victory procession, would march through the biggest street in Rome, and the emperor would sit, and the crowd would applaud his son. That picture is taken up in the Bible. And it says that Jesus ascended on high, bringing captives with him, giving gifts to men, the spoil of the battle. It's, it's all there, a victorious son coming back from battle victorious. And usually the emperor then would reward his son by saying, come and sit on my right hand and the son would leave his chariot and climb the steps to the throne and sit down with his father. In fact, it was not unknown in the Roman Empire for the emperor then to say, you are now the emperor. You take over the emperor's position. You rule. Now, all that kind of language is picked up in Paul's letters about the Ascension. He was going home. He was going home safe and sound. He was going home victorious. And one can only imagine the welcome that Jesus got when he got back to heaven. We're not told exactly, but do you think the angels could keep quiet when he got back victorious? But actually what happened was he was then crowned. The ascension is Jesus' coronation. When God exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, and he was crowned king of the universe. The coronation. You know that the British are better than anybody at spectacle. You've seen that at the royal wedding was second to none, and I make that claim. We can make the best show on earth out of a royal event. But I can remember vividly watching the first time I'd ever seen television and watching the coronation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. What a show that was. The golden coach is brought out for that. A whole coach covered in gold. It's a spectacle. And uh, maybe you'll see it in your lifetime again. It's very rare. Uh, my father was a, a guest of the royal family at that wedding. And I love to see the old films of it because I can pick him out. And I kind of feel I was there. <laughs> but the ascension is Christ's coronation day. 
That's why we celebrate it. The day when he's crowned king, when all authority in heaven and on earth is given to his hands, when he sits at the right hand of the Father and takes over the running of the universe. That's what the ascension means. He's king of kings, lord of lords, president of presidents, prime minister of prime ministers. He's it. And this is the great day when he ascended to heaven and sat down on his throne. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, God super exalted him. Not just exalted him, as our Bible says, but the word is super exalted him and gave him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, the saints from the Old Testament would welcome him. The angels would welcome him. The Father welcomed him. Imagine the scene. It's not described for us. It almost be too much for us. But I can imagine it. This was the great day to which Jesus had looked forward. And he endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. And the joy was the day of his coronation. He was looking forward to this when he went through the cross. It helped him through the cross to know that that was waiting for him afterwards. The government is now on his shoulder. And we need to remember an often overlooked feature. When Jesus went back to heaven, he was different. He was not the person who had left heaven. He was now human. Can you imagine what the angels felt when they saw a human being made lower than the angels, now reigning above them? Never forget, there is now a human being in charge of the universe. He'd come down, adopted our human nature, permanently and went back to heaven as a man. He is still a man and he's running the whole universe on our behalf. He's doing it for the church and he's doing it for the whole world and he is reigning now until all his enemies are beneath his feet. That's the objective. There are still people who don't acknowledge him still nations that don't acknowledge him, but he will reign. One of the most quoted Old Testament Psalms in the New, in fact, the most quoted text, is from Psalm 110. And it appears more times in the New Testament than any other Old Testament text. He will reign until all his enemies are beneath his feet. That's what we're looking forward to. He's reigning already, but there are many who don't acknowledge it. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. So there's a man in highest heaven who represents us there. And even more mysterious in a way to our finite minds, there's now a man in the Godhead. Jesus has taken our human nature into the Godhead. God is different. He was not like this before, but now in the Godhead itself, there is one person who is a human being like us. And he will remain that human being forever. And when he comes back, you will see a human being. And that's the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. Well, now that's what it meant for Jesus. But I'm going to move on from that. I want to look at the ascension from our point of view. What does it mean to us that he has ascended? Well, I've almost already told you. We have a human being at the very center of the universe. 
I was talking to a Roman Catholic lady and I said, why do you pray to Mary? And she said, because he's human. Because she's human, she understands this. And I said, but don't you realize that Jesus is human? And he understands us. He's been tempted just as we are. He's the best person we could have up in heaven pleading for us when we do silly and sinful things. It's a great thing to us that we've got Jesus up in heaven, that there is only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. We don't need anyone else. We've got him, and he's a perfect high priest. We need a priest. We need a priest to represent us, but we don't need earthly priests. That's a mistake that many churches have made. We are all priests. The priesthood of all believers is part of the New Testament teaching, but we need a high priest. And we've got one. And the best one we could ever have. So we are all priests, but we've got a high priest to represent us before God. And we go through him to God even when we pray, we say at the end of a prayer, through Jesus Christ our Lord, not because that's a kind of formula, but because we're praying through Jesus. And it's Jesus who said, whatever you ask, in my name, I will give it to you. So our prayers are taken by Jesus and presented to the Father as our high priest. And could we have a better one who understands us perfectly, who's been through it all, as we go through it all? He understands and he represents you. When a Christian sins, two things happen in heaven. The first is there is one person in heaven who accuses us. He is the accuser of the brethren. Don't think Satan's in hell, not yet. He's in heaven. And he accuses the brethren in heaven. And in the heavenly council, he said, one of your people has sinned. But the same New Testament that tells us he accuses the brethren tells us we have an advocate before the Father and he represents us against Satan. So whenever we sin, Satan jumps on that and says, there you are, Lord. He's sinning, he's not holy. And the Lord Jesus steps in as our advocate on high. Read the first letter of John, the first chapter, which talks about our advocate. So we have an accuser and an advocate. And you couldn't have a better advocate, as I showed you in the story of the woman taken in, in adultery. Jesus is the best lawyer there ever was. Jesus can say, neither do I condemn you. And he pleads our case before God. Furthermore, he intercedes for us. Now, you know, we tend to think too highly of our intercession. At least we're thinking too highly of it when we forget his intercession for us. When nobody else is praying for you, Jesus is. What a thought. He's the greatest intercessor there ever was. And the New Testament says he is interceding for us before the Father. He, he said to Simon Peter, Peter, I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. Just let him speak your name there. What is it? Mary, John, and Jesus saying, I'm praying for you. Oh, but Lord, I'm too busy interceding for the nation. I'm interceding for you. Just remember that when you begin your intercession for other people, that you start by thanking Jesus for interceding for you and praying for you. That's just one of the things he's doing for you in heaven. As he prayed for his disciples on earth, so he prays for us now in heaven. Let's move on. Let's ask, what is Jesus doing for us now 
that he wasn't doing for us before he ascended? Well, here's something you twits can put on your Twitter, or whatever it is. <laughs> here's a sentence for you. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he became a Baptist. Let that sink in. There are two people in the New Testament called Baptist. One is Jesus' cousin John, and the other is Jesus himself. And in fact, both are described with the same Greek words, ho baptizein, which means he who baptizes. And from that comes the word noun, Baptist. John was a Baptist, Jesus became a Baptist when he ascended to heaven. Let me explain. The word baptize is never or very rarely translated into English. It's transliterated. And so it's spelled in English letters, but it's still the same Greek word, baptize. But what does it mean in English? It means to be dipped to be plunged, to be soaked. It means basically to plunge a solid totally in a liquid. It was used of dyeing wool, and you took the wool and you plunged it into the color dye, totally immersed it so every part of it would be colored, and that was called baptizing wool. It was used of taking a cup and dipping it into a bowl, a punch bowl of liquid to get a drink and you put the cup down into the liquid and brought it up full of the liquid and you had baptized it. When you hear of a ship being baptized, that does not refer to it being launched with a bottle of champagne broken over its bows and God bless all who sail and in her and all that, that's not baptizing a ship. It is when a ship is sunk and goes to the bottom of the ocean. That's when the Greek newspapers say, ship baptized. It always means to plunge a solid totally in a liquid. That's the meaning of the word. And John dipped people into water totally. And therefore he was nicknamed John the Plunger, or John the Dipper, or John the Soaker, or John the Baptizer. And he it was who said, there is someone coming after me who won't plunge you into water, but he'll plunge you into the Holy Spirit. He'll soak you in the Holy Spirit. He'll dip you in the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus came on earth, he didn't do that. Not once during his whole ministry did he ever plunge anyone into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was with his disciples, but not in them. And that's what he said to them at the end of his earthly life. The Holy Spirit will be in you when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, when you're plunged, soaked, dipped in him. But he didn't do it. And when he went back home, he still hadn't done it for anybody. He talked about living water springing up inside people who believed in him, but it hadn't happened. Because he couldn't do it until he got back to heaven and received the gift of the Holy Spirit from his Father to pour out on ordinary people like us. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, stay in Jerusalem and you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Wait until you receive the power. Wait until you're plunged, soaked, dipped in the Holy Spirit. And that happened on the day of Pentecost. And it couldn't happen until Jesus took his place in heaven. And then... He received the power of the Holy Spirit for others and poured it out on 120 men and women, including his mother. 
and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied and the Holy Spirit now belonged to people. And all the way through the rest of the book of Acts, more and more people were plunged in the Spirit and dipped in the Spirit. And so the church spread. Well, that's what I mean when I say that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he became a Baptist. Neither an American Baptist nor a Southern Baptist. He became a baptizer. And that title was given to him, as well as to his cousin John. I can just see the Twitter now. Pawson says, Jesus became a Baptist. <laughs> but it's true. And I like saying things in an unusual way because that uh, makes you think, doesn't it? I wonder what you thought when I first said Jesus became a Baptist when he ascended. But he did. And he was now able to baptize people in the Holy Spirit. And he's been doing that ever since. And he could only do it because he went back up there. Nobody could be filled with the Spirit on earth until Jesus had ascended. That's the truth. And because he is now pouring out his Spirit on people, he is pouring gifts onto people, gifts that they never had, supernatural gifts to do things they could never do before. I'm tempted to give you my testimony there, but I'll see if I have time at the end as to when I was baptized in the Spirit. But uh, you remind me when we get to the end and we'll share that with you. But he is now pouring out his Spirit and ordinary people are getting extraordinary gifts. If you think of your natural gifts, you might be tempted to have an inferiority complex. Don't worry, you're a great candidate for baptism in the Spirit, and you'll find yourself doing extraordinary things, things that ordinary people can't do, because he is pouring out his Spirit and gifts. The greatest gift of the Father was his Son. The next greatest gift of the Father was his Holy Spirit. He gave us his Son, but without the next gift, where would we be? He's given us of his spirit, says John the Apostle. What a generous Lord. In other words, the church was meant to be charismatic, which means gifted. A church of ministries that come from above, whether apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. I'm number five in that list. I'm a teacher, but I'm perfectly happy with being number five. <laughs> whatever. They're not graded. God gives different gifts to different people to build up his church, to make it strong and healthy and able to do his work. He even said, greater works than these shall you do. You will do greater miracles than I've done, said Jesus to his disciples. And I'm often asked, what are the greater miracles? Well, my answer is very simple. You do all his miracles, and then you can think about the greater ones. Don't bother t to discuss the greater ones until you've done them all. <laughs> and then you can move on to the greater ones. People are so curious mentally about the greater gifts that they don't even bother with the others. Do what Jesus did. Go on doing what he used to do. That's what the Spirit means. I can do what Jesus did. And then let him decide what the greater gifts are. That's my answer to that. Secondly, he's not only a Baptist, but he's the mediator. He's the one person we need to act as mediator between sinners and a holy God. Somebody's needed in between who can represent God to sinners and sinners to God. We all need that mediator. And because he's a man, he is ideal to be a mediator between God and man. We need that mediator to plead for us. Because of that accuser of the brethren, we need an advocate and we've got it. Another title that is given to Jesus in the letter to the Hebrews, because of his ascension, is that he's our pioneer. 
our trailblazer would be a, a translation. Now, this was how America was built, with pioneers who went west and opened up new territory. And really, the story of America is the story of pioneers who wanted to go further into unknown territory. I've forgotten the names, but you had two famous pioneers, didn't you, who went up the Missouri and went west. Sorry? I'm sorry, my he hearing is bad. No, it's okay. They all know anyway. <laughs> they all want to tell me. But those two were pioneers, and where they went, they opened up country for others to follow and plant ranches and homes and settle. Jesus has gone as our pioneer. Do you remember I told you that God's order in his old creation was God, angels, humans, animals. In the new creation, that's going to be changed. It's going to be God, humans, angels, animals. Isn't that amazing? God is actually taking redeemed human beings and setting them above the angels. So the angels will become our servants and they will minister to us. That's your destiny in Christ. He has gone ahead of us as pioneer. He's the first human being to be above the angels. And he's only there to blaze the trail for us to follow. And if you read the letter to the Hebrews, it's all about following Jesus to that high place in creation. Oh, we must prepare for our destiny. We must realize that we are being called above the angels. And where he is seated at the right hand of the Father, that's where we're going to be. So he is our pioneer. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Has he gone back to carpentry? <laughs> is he preparing a house with many rooms? I don't know. I'll wait and see on that one. But he's not only preparing a place for us, but a position for us. And that position in the new creation is quite different from the old. He made man a little lower than the angels, but we see one man now above the angels where we are going to follow. And God is changing the order of creation. And fourthly, I would like to say that he's our ruler, our king. And first of all, he's ruling the church Church is a very unusual body because its body is on earth but its head is in heaven. And sometimes there's a, what's the word I'm wanting, a spastic condition where the head is unable to control the body. And that leads to all kinds of trouble. When the body will not do what the head wants, you get a, a diseased condition a dreadful condition, but I'm afraid it happens very often where the church decides what it wants to do and the head doesn't want that. So even though the church is a body on earth, it constantly needs to be referring to its head in heaven so that it's a demonstration of the rule of heaven on earth so that it's a, a clear demonstration of heaven itself, a colony of heaven on earth. That's his plan for the church. And he will do it if we allow him to rule us and be our head. Secondly, he's head of the world. Paul goes on to say that he is head over all things for the church. He's ruling the nations for the church's sake and what he does with whole nations, he's doing for the sake of the church. And that's a lovely truth. He's the head over all things. 
nothing happens without his command. He is sustaining the universe. He is drawing the atlas of the nations. He takes territory from the nation, gives it to another. He's in charge. There was a little child on a train all by himself and uh, he was sitting in the carriage looking quite happy and quite at peace and he was all by himself and the other passengers in the compartment uh, got a little worried about him. They thought he was traveling all alone and they said, uh, are you by yourself? He said, yes. And they said, aren't you worried to be by yourself? No, he said. Why not? Well, he said, my daddy is driving this train. <laughs> and that's what you can say in a simple way. You're a child of God. You can say, my Savior is driving this train. <laughs> He's in charge. He isn't surprised by anything. He's not lost control. He's going to bring all things together because the whole goal of history is that all things should be summed up in Christ. And everything we do to help that to happen is taking part in the purpose of history. One day it'll all be his. And we are looking forward to that day. The sun, moon and stars only shine because Jesus allows them to. He could shut them out, shut them off at a moment and will do one day. He is in charge not just of the church, not just of the world, but of the entire universe. And that gives us a security. But now I must tell you the end of the story, of that story anyway. When everything's under his feet, when every nation is under his control, when everything in the entire universe is in Christ, he's going to give it up. Have you read that in your Bible? He's going to hand it all back to the Father. <laughs> that God may be all in all. What a phrase. So he's doing it for his Father. And he won't rest until the nations acknowledge him. And everything is under his feet. And then he says, Father, I've got it all back for you. Here it is. And he will present the kingdom to the Father, that his Father may be all in all. I think I'm going to stop there and give you my testimony. Okay. <laughs> I'll be quite honest, for many years, I was uh, a binitarian. Do you know what that means? I believed in two persons of the Trinity. And I taught two persons of the Trinity because I knew them both. I knew the Father and I knew the Son. And I was happy preaching a gospel that was all about the Father and the Son. I didn't like preaching about the Holy Spirit. I had to once a year because there was Pentecost Sunday in the church calendar and everybody expected two sermons about the Holy Spirit. And by reading some books, I managed to put enough together <laughs> to keep them happy. But I was so glad to get back to the gospel the next Sunday, what I thought was the gospel. And so I preached the Father and Son and God did honor that because he does honor truth, but it wasn't the whole truth. In my postgraduate year at Cambridge, I had majored on one question in my research, what happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2? And so I had written papers on this theme, which got a good mark. I call it emptying the church by degrees. Get it? No. All right, you can think of it. But uh, I used to produce these papers, and if I put enough Greek into them and quoted enough scholars, they were accepted as good students' work. But I didn't know the Holy Spirit, and it bugged me. I thought, 
what is it about the Holy Spirit? I just don't understand. And uh, then I began to uh, look after a church. I became a pastor. And I still preached all I knew about the Father and the Son. But it was binitarian. It wasn't Trinitarian. And one day I decided, I said, I'm fed up with this problem. I'm going to preach about the Holy Spirit. And I decided to, well, I announced that I would preach 20 sermons on the Holy Spirit in one year. And I would go through the Bible looking at every mention of the Holy Spirit and put those into my series of sermons. So I began with the Spirit bringing order out of chaos with creation in Genesis. And I went through all the tales of people like Samson and the prophets who spoke by the Holy Spirit and all the amazing things that the Holy Spirit enabled them to do. And I managed quite successfully to get through the Old Testament. Then I began on the New. And I managed Matthew and Mark and Luke quite well. And I got into John. And that was beginning to get a bit tricky. And I'd arranged to reach Acts 2 on Pentecost Sunday. I thought that's going to be so appropriate, isn't it? But I still didn't know what happened. And all my papers at Cambridge had come to the conclusion that Pentecost was too far away for anybody to be sure what happened. Quite skeptical. Well, I remember I got to John 15 and I was beginning to get out of my depth and I began to wish I'd never started the series. But I just had to go on with it and I was dreading getting to Acts 2 and telling them I don't know what happened. Now, something else happened in the church at that time, coincidentally, and uh, there was a man in our church who every spring developed hay fever. When the pollen count went up, his chest became congested with fluid. And he became so weak that he was put to bed for anything up to six weeks until his congested chest had cleared. He was a clever man. He was in charge of a patent office in London. You know where you register a patent for a new invention? He was a clever chap, was, and his name was James. And uh, just at this time, when I got to John 15 in the series, James developed hay fever, and his lungs congested, and he was put to bed, and was lying there gasping for breath, and gray complexion, and... Uh, I thought I'd better go and see him. I didn't want to, because he was the unofficial leader of the opposition in the church. There's always one, have you noticed? Sometimes more than one, but there's usually one man who opposes everything the pastor suggests. And he was that man. Anything I suggested for the church to do that was different, he either opposed it because we've done it before and it didn't work, or we've never done it before and we're not going to try. Well, that pretty well covered everything I suggested. <laughs> and I used to come home from church meetings really frustrated by this one man, James. And I would complain to my wife, why did God send James to this church? And she would say to me, look, David, the rest of the church is all with you. It's only James. That's just him. Don't worry about one man. But I did worry about him uh, because he just opposed me so often. And you do worry about things like that. Well, I thought I'll go and see him. So on a Sunday afternoon, I went to see him. And all the way there, I couldn't get out of my mind James chapter 5, probably because his name was that. And I remember James chapter 5 said, Is any sick? Let him call for the elders. Let them anoint him with oil and he'll be healed. And all the way there, I couldn't get this out of my brain. And when I got to his bedroom and he was gasping there and lying back, he said, 
what do you think about James 5? And I said, well, I have been thinking about it. Why do you ask? Well, he said, I've got to go to Switzerland on Thursday for business. And the doctors put me to bed for weeks. And he said, uh, would you come and anoint me with oil? So I said, I'll pray about it. That's a good get out, isn't it? <laughs> and I went home and I tried to pray about it. And I thought, I don't want him well. I've got a few weeks when I can suggest things to the church that they'll do. I was thankful that he was ill. And I said, Lord, give me one good reason why I shouldn't go and anoint him with oil. And the Lord was silent. The heavens were brass. And uh, by the Wednesday, I was in quite a state, but his wife rang up and she said, look, he's... He's got an air ticket for tomorrow to go to Switzerland. Will you come and anoint him tonight? And by this time, I couldn't think of an excuse. And I'd never done that before, actually, in my ministry. So I, I said, all right, I'll come tonight. And I went to the drugstore and I bought a big bottle of olive oil. And I called the other elders and I said, we're going to Jimmy's house tonight, to James. And we arrived at his bedroom. But something had happened before we got there. I went alone into our church building and I knelt in the pulpit and I tried to pray for James. Have you ever tried to pray for someone you didn't want to be well? That you were glad was in bed? jolly difficult. I didn't know what to say. I tried to pray for him, but I couldn't. I didn't want him to get better. And then quite suddenly, I was speaking a language I never learned. And I think it was Chinese. It sounded like that. Anyway, I prayed in this language. And I remember looking at my watch and saying, I haven't been praying an hour, but I had. And I looked at the watch and I said, Lord, I prayed for Jimmy for an hour and not in my own language. And I thought, I wonder if I can do that again. <laughs> and I did and something like Russian came out. And I was praying for Jimmy with all my heart. And I thought, this is what happened in Acts 2. This is it. And so I thought, boy, something's going to happen tonight. And that night, some of the elders and myself went to his bedroom. And we opened the Bible at James 5, and we almost treated it as a car service manual. You know how you look what you do next. And the first thing it said was, confess your sins to one another. I thought, well, we better do that. So I said to James, I've never liked you. And he, he said to me, that's mutual. <laughs> and we went through the book and then it said, now anoint him with oil. So I got this bottle and I took the cork out and I went <laughs> all over his head. And then we looked at the Bible and we said, we've done everything. Guess what happened? Absolutely nothing. And he lay there, gray. And I just thought, we've really blundered. And I got up and ran away. And I got as far as the door and I turned back and I said, have you still got your air ticket, James, for tomorrow? He said, of course. I said, I'll run you to the airport. And then I ran. And I thought, I, I, oh, he'll be worse than ever now because he's not been healed and oh boy, it was bad enough before but now I've made this situation 10 times worse. And I didn't sleep that night. And in the morning I didn't dare to contact him. And I tried to go into my study and work but the telephone rang about uh, 9.30. And hello, this is James. Will you run me to the airport at 11 o'clock? I said, James, 
Ha, are you better? <laughs> I was totally surprised to hear his voice and it sounded healthy, no huskiness. And he said, yes, I'm better. He said, I've been to the uh, hairdresser to have my hair cut to go to Switzerland. And he said, I'm afraid, sir, I'm going to have to give you a shampoo before I cut your hair. He said, I've never had such oily hair in my life. <laughs> so he got his hair cut and then he rang me. I said, but James, are you feeling up to it? Does your doctor say you can go? Yes, he said, I've been to see the doctor. I said, what happened? He said, in the middle of the night, it was as if two huge hands squeezed my chest and I brought up a bucket full of liquid. And he said, I can breathe. And so I ran him to the airport. Now then, that man became my best friend. <laughs> Not only that, but he and his wife got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And not only that, he'd had the weak chest since he was a boy and he's never had it again. Well, I got into the pulpit the next Sunday to continue my series on the Holy Spirit. And I thought I just preached as I'd done in all the previous sermons. I'd prepared my notes weeks back and I just took the next study in the Holy Spirit in John. As normal, I wasn't conscious of any difference at all. But a young man came to me afterwards and he said, what's happened to you this week? I said, why do you ask? Well, he said, this week, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> and that man is now a missionary working among Iranians. Young carpenter, actually. And from then I was in a new dimension of ministry and have been, I trust, ever since. I'm Trinitarian. <laughs> I believe in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And uh, that's my testimony about that. I hope you've had the same experience and that you know personally the Father and His Son and the Holy Spirit. You are a true Christian, if so. Let me just go back in the last few moments I've got to the Ascension. When the ascension is neglected, certain things creep in that are not really part of the New Testament gospel. Once you believe that Christ has ascended and is seated at the right hand of God, you no longer talk about invite Christ into your life. Open your heart and let Christ in as if little Jesus creeps into your heart. You think of him as down here on earth, living in people's hearts. But when you really believe in the ascension, you know that he's up there where his father is ruling the universe. You get a much bigger view of Jesus, not Jesus coming in here on earth, but reigning up there. It's his spirit that comes in here. And yet so often evangelists say, open your heart and let Jesus in. And they will use a text that has no meaning for evangelism. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, let him open the door and I will come in to him and sup with him. That's a prophetic word, word to a church that has lost Christ. It's nothing to do with conversion. But that text has been taken out of context. There are only two verses in the whole of Paul's letters that talk about Christ in you. One is in, uh, where are they? One is in Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
And the you there is plural, not singular. It's not Christ in you and you and you. It's Christ in you. And the other verse is, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And it's very clear that in both cases, Paul is talking about the Spirit of Christ. That's what's in us. But dozens of times, Paul talks about you being in Christ. That's the major one. Twice he does talk about Christ in you, but he's clearly from the context, meaning the Spirit in you, but all the other times he says a Christian is someone who is in Christ. When you became a Christian, you weren't saying Christ come in here. You were saying I am now in Christ. And that's a very different thing. Because it means that you are up there. You are seated with him in heavenly places. He's not down here, so if you're in Christ, you're up there. And that has profound implications for the way you live. I remember meeting a German pastor, and he said, you know, when I was young, I was in Hitler Youth. And when we joined, one of the officers in Hitler Youth asked us a question. He said, where do you live? And I said, in Hamburg. He said, wrong answer, where do you live? In Germany? Wrong answer, where do you live? In the Third Reich, or the Third Kingdom of Germany? Wrong answer, where do you live? And he said, I didn't know what the answer should be. So I asked him, what should I have said? From now on you say, I live in Hitler. That's your address. That's your home. That's where you belong. I live in Hitler. But the pastor said to me, there came a day when I began to live in Christ. And that's my new address. I'm in Christ now. That's where I belong. And Christ is up there. And when you come to be in Christ, you are already in heaven. Your spirit is. Your body may still be on earth and still be convincing you every day you're on earth, but actually you are now in Christ, seated with him in heavenly places in your spirit. And when you die, you don't go to heaven because you're already there. What happens when you die is that your body stops telling you you're on earth. <laughs> and your spirit realizes where you are and where you've been for so long. For the Christian, death is already past. And therefore, you don't, don't go to heaven. You just stay there in Christ. And all you're conscious of, all your spirit is telling you is, you are with Christ in heaven. So death is not to be feared. You don't go anywhere. You're in heaven already. That's the spiritual truth. Your spirit is already there. But the trouble is, when I wake up in the, my, in the morning, my body tells me I'm down here. And if I'm not careful, I forget that I'm up there. And my senses tell me too much about my environment down here. Listen to your spirit. And that's why Paul says, if you then are risen with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where I am now, spiritually. You think I'm sitting in IHOP in the middle of Grandview, Kansas City. Well, that's the address of my body at the moment. But my spirit is hidden with Christ in glory. <laughs> I'm there! <laughs> and, uh, when I come to die, my body will simply stop talking about earth to me. And all I will hear is what my spirit says. You are with Christ. You're in him. And you've been in him for many years without fully realizing it. 
So Paul is constantly saying, seek the things above, live in Christ, live in heaven now. Realize your spirit is in him. He's not so much in you down here, you are in him up there. And that's the truth you need to be constantly telling yourself so that you live as if you're already up there. Well, I think I've said enough now. Don't bring Christ down here. Don't try and persuade people to invite Christ into their little life. Bring them into Christ so they're in him. All this language, this jargon that we use in evangelism, you don't find any trace of it in the New Testament. What we find there is believe in Christ at the right hand of the Father and receive his Holy Spirit on earth. They never say receive Christ. They never say commit yourself to Christ. They never say invite him into your heart. All that's in language we've invented. They said repent toward God, believe in Jesus, Receive the Holy Spirit. Be baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's all there. Christian life was meant to be Trinitarian from the beginning. And may the Lord keep us in that Trinitarian relationship, demonstrating what heaven's like to the earth around us. For his name's sake. Amen. You have been listening to David Pawson. Other talks by David Pawson can be downloaded free of charge from his websites davidpawson.org or davidpawson.co.uk. Thank you for listening.